Welcome back. Final lecture in our Iran series began with the prehistory of the revolution. Then we looked at the revolution and the constitution. Today we look at what happens to Iran after the Islamic revolution. We'll end with everyone's favorite person, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Life in Iran in the 1980s it was very different than it had been under the Shah. The Shah was a westernizer. The Shah wore a suit and tie. After the Shah, there was a renewed emphasis on hijab, on Islamic dress. 1962, Rahola Khomeini declared that 20 odd years had passed since the scandalous forced removal of the Islamic veil, hijab. Check and see what you have done. Put women into the offices. And every office they've been put into has become paralyzed. If women are put into an organization, it will upset conditions there. Do you want women to provide your independence? Lovely bit of that. Uh, Enlightened attitude there for Ruhollah Khomeini. As we saw in the Constitution, women had two roles wife and mother, the producer of men, or as Hamas would say, the factories of men, in a lovely turn of phrase. One way to control women is to control the way they dress. hijab. Enforcing not only the dress code, but proper Islamic living, was the Revolutionary Guard. As you can tell by their name, they were formed in the cauldron of the Revolution. The Revolutionary Guard is a religiously based military. There's precedent for this in Western history. During the English Civil War, the middle of the 17th century, Parliament was eventually victorious because they formed a religiously based military, the so-called New Model Army. On the streets, the Revolutionary Guard in force the regime's idea of what proper attire and proper living are. There's an Arabic word for this, mutawin, singular mutawa, religious police. We've seen this already in Saudi Arabia, the Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, whose logo is not an appropriate word, but that's what it is. Logo is pictured here. It's a lovely amalgamation of a book, the, Torah, uh, the, the, the Quran, of course, and uh, a figure, uh, figuration of the actual outline of Saudi Arabia there. Revolutionary guards are the mutawin in Iran. 1981, the dress code was revised. Under the Shah, women had been allowed to unveil, just as they had been allowed in Turkey following Ataturk's reforms in the 1920s after World War I. The veil returns in force here in Iran. The 1981 dress code presents some rationales for it. It says, quote, women who do not comply with the strict rules of hijab promote a contemptuous attitude towards themselves becoming mere objects for men's pleasure. Moreover, such conduct causes a drop in the marriage rate. A woman with a pleasant appearance hinders other girls from finding a husband. It also makes the selection difficult for men. You will constantly think of a model who is beyond everybody. Recall that in the Iranian constitution, there are guarantees of universal equal rights for men and women. However, 
women's rights must be in conformity with Islamic criteria. That Islamic criteria, as we learned in the introductory lecture, is based on Sharia. Sharia, which is, of course, based on only two sources, the Quran and the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet. The man being interviewed right now is the Iranian interior minister, interviewed in 2007, discussing hijab, discussing the proper dress for women. What we're seeing now are women confronting other women on the streets in Iran, questioning their clothing. The women who are being questioned are not free to leave. As you can see, there's a revolutionary guard standing right behind them. There's another revolutionary guard and the two women all in the black contours there. If your head is uncovered in that scarf you are wearing, they say, do you think it is appropriate? You can see her hair, after all. Inappropriate. Notice this gathering here. This is peer pressure in... Uh, in everyday life, you could call it, and the ever, uh, ever present revolutionary guard on the right there, walking backwards and forwards. This is something that you would have seen in the Middle Ages. This is, this is a fairly remarkable way to run a modern society, if you ask me. This is daily reality in Iran today. But as we're going to see, it was not daily reality in Iran during the 1990s. 1990s, things changed. The pendulum has swung back. And it swung back because of, because of Mahmoud, Ahmadinejad. Scenes like these on the streets of Tehran were omnipresent in the 1980s, less frequent in the 1990s, and since the election in 2005 of Ahmadinejad, an increasingly common sight. Now, there's two ways to think about this. On the one hand, you can argue that this is subjugation of women. You can argue that this is preventing women from expressing themselves. This is forcing them into a corner, forcing them to hide themselves. But consider what this sign says. Hijab is dignity. The counter-argument made by proponents of hijab is that here in the West, women are sexual objects. Women must always consider themselves as sexual objects if they want to get ahead in the Western world, they argue. And that's a difficult argument to refute. I think many women in modern American society would say on the one hand they feel that they are much more valued as individuals now, as people, but they would also tell you that Sexuality is part of the equation. That they are judged on their appearance, much more so than men. Judged on how they dress, much more so than men. I think this was actually apparent during the, uh, the last presidential election. Things were said about Hillary, Hillary Clinton and the way she was dressed, and that never would have been said about a man. So before we rush to judgment here on the Iranians. Consider the counter-argument. It's, it's an interesting thought experiment, to say the least. There are two sides to the hijab argument.